why do so many companies fail to survive their founders? What we're talking about today in the Central Business Show. I'm John Naylor. I'm joined by Don McKenzie from Adesis. Thank you, John. Um, part three of this series. Wonderful information. Really valuable too. Thank I you. Really do appreciate your time here. Now, companies, yeah, so often, so frequently we find a company rises to some success and goes on for almost a generation, but then fails spectacularly in the hands of um, the next generation. You got some opinions about that? Sure, it's, it's, it's not just at the next generation. We're finding because the world is changing more and more, um, companies are coming up and being successful and then disappearing far quicker than before. Oh, yes, one, of the, one of the stats is that in the 1920s, if you got into the S&P 500, you were there for about 65 years. Oh, okay. Now, if you get into the S&P 500, it's about 15 years you oh, last there. Right. So, so surviving is getting more and more difficult. Mm. And what we find is that it comes back to something we've discussed in the past, that as, as long as an organization is identifying problems and resolving them mm. and identifying and capitalizing on opportunities, it's fine. And often what we found, find with really successful founders and, and even families that control businesses, they're really good at doing that. They're really good at identifying problems, solving them, identifying opportunities and capitalizing on them. Mm. But what happens is two things. Either when the founder leaves, sells, transitions, whatever, they take with them that capability. They haven't institutionalized that ability into the organization. Mm. So it can keep doing those things while he or she or the family isn't there anymore. Mm, sure. um, or the complexity or the change just, just starts to creep up in the business mm. and the founder and the family can no longer make the decisions that are good enough and implement them quick enough. And so we have this thing in our, our organizational life cycle model called the founder's trap, mm. where the vast majority of organizations fall into this trap. And it was developed by Dr. Adesis over 50 years ago and has been used in over 70 countries, even with national governments. And it just highlights, and, and, and it's not our statistics. If you, if you do the research, the majority never survived the, f the founder. And, sure. and well, why? We know that intrinsically, yeah. And I myself have had a number of founders traps mm -hmm. where I've had businesses that didn't survive me. Now, at the time, I didn't realize. I, bl I, was, I blamed everything else. <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. market. Yeah, okay. Hiring the wrong people. Like, yeah, it, it, none of that. You put in place when you took off. Sort of. it, was, it was me. Mm. It was my fault. And the reason was I didn't realize that part of my role as an owner and as a leader is to institutionalize the ability for the organization to do those things, identify problems and solve them really quickly and capitalize on opportunities. And so often people in business are told, work on the business. Don't just work in the business, work on the business. And I'd sit there and scratch my head and what, what does that actually mean, work on the business? Yeah, did you resolve that? Oh, I'm well, I, I, <laughs> after a while, I then realized, well, hang on, part of it I think is, Working on the business is institutionalized, is, is, is if I was to leave and go away, mm. this business can identify and resolve problems, harness all of the conflicts that normally happen inside an organization, and capitalize on opportunities faster than their competitors. Sure, sure. And so, that, that's a, you know. So even some of the practical things about that, I kind of think that I remember watching a Tom Peters presentation some time ago, and he, he said, as a founder or a leader in your organization, the best thing you can respond to when someone comes in and says, I've got this problem, the best response you can have is, I don't know. You know, I mean, it is, it's kind of that thing where you, you've got to culturally I, I, ingrain this, you know, the... I, the, I would go one step further though. That, that's fine. I don't know, mm. but it's, I have a systems process, whatever, you, whatever works for you, Enjoy. to help you unpack this issue yourself. So with... With a lot of the work we do, sometimes a bit tongue in cheek, we say we're like organizational therapists. Okay. We're not there to tell you what your problem is and give you a solution. Mm. We are there to transfer the tools and technology so you unpack that problem, mm. you unpack that solution. Now, traditional management theory sort of progressed and it was like, don't come to me with your problems, come to me with your solutions. Oh, that's right. That's an older bit of goodie, yeah. But often, if you tell someone to come to you with a solution, half the time the problem's the wrong problem. They mm. haven't identified the right problem. They haven't unpacked it. They haven't worked out what the criteria of success looks like before getting to a solution. Mm. And mm. so what happens is if they come to you with a solution for the right problem, no problem. 
Mm. But half the time, what they think the real problem is, isn't the problem. Mm. And so what you've got to be able to do is get really great at helping your environment, your people, your culture, mm. identify problems, unpack them properly, unpack what the real problem is, and then be able to come up with a solution. Now, the problem is in every organization, we have differences of opinion, different styles, different interests, different values, different perceptions. Mm. And if you haven't found a way to harness that, a very small problem can blow up into a major energy consuming issue mm. because we're all caught in these conflicts. So having, and the thing is that founders are very good at quashing all that, controlling all of that conflict. Yeah, sort of in their leader we trust type thing and it's, it's and then they it's leave, beautiful, but it, and then you see a lot of successful companies that sell, and the new owners it, it dies on them, mm. and a lot of people will then blame the new owners. And we talked about it in our first video that the X factor type, thing, yeah. you know, it sort of disappears with the founder, and unfortunately that culture and that behaviour is is stashed in his head, and you, it's gone, you know. So F founders and really entrepreneurial people tend to underestimate the actual input they have. Mm. They think their time and energy is unlimited and they, because this was only a quick 30 second phone call, it didn't mean anything. Mm. But the, the, the intent and intellect and the, it might have just course corrected something. Mm. They just did a little, a little input that put that manager or CEO or CEO on a different course and that made all the difference. But they don't, they don't see that. And then so when the business isn't around, because they haven't institutionalized that stuff. And so, we, we see with a lot of companies that just that you know go through recent listings right it was in a different environment with different structures and different people and whatever else and it was quite successful then they go into the listed environment yeah, all the scrutiny all the controls all the things and often the founders aren't as engaged anymore mm. then we start to see a performance or even they're marginalized you know and, and things lose their way in the fact that Could they, be. they've lost the Control. And so the right sequence is actually how do I first institutionalize that raw ability to identify problems really quickly, work out what to do and implement that decision, and how do I capitalize on opportunities faster than my competitors? Mm. And so if you're the founder of a business out there, I would really get you to have a look at, um, or if you're a family controlling businesses, Am I institutionalizing, am I investing in the things that are going to help this organization identify and capitalize? Okay. And if the answer is yes, then you'll be successful. Okay. If the answer is no, there's a problem. All right, so fundamental around this, so this is getting down and wrapping up this sort of three-part series, is so, and I heard it over and over again, is this, this thing, that, and obviously a core cool part of the Adesis methodology or whatever, is, is teaching an organization, small, small, medium or large, young or old, is how to identify problems and resolve them, identify opportunities and seize upon them, yeah? And, and do it for themselves. Transfer the technology and the tools and the system so we're not. Mm. They're doing it for themselves and so they, they disappear on and just continue to do this without the need for external consultants. If you constantly need to have external consultants making you successful, it's not a very sustainable business. But if you have that capability, then when you do get a consultant and they're often very much needed, you mm. can really capitalize on the great ideas they're bringing yeah, sure. because you have that capability. We've identified this problem and we yeah, we, we need solving it. Let's bring someone in. Bring somebody so, in. Same thing with an opportunity. Absolutely. Maybe we've seen this opportunity. How do we, you know, how do we add people? A lot of growing product? companies need consultants, yeah. but they first need the capability and capacity to execute on what the consultant's going to tell them. Mm. That is the correct sequence. Fabulous, all right. Well, now, how do people find out more about this Adesis methodology and get uh, in contact with you? Uh, simply on the website, www.adesis.com. Yeah. There's a lot of information, and you can go to the Australian page, and I'll be there. Oh, fabulous. Okay, Don McKenzie, really appreciate you coming in and speaking on the Central Business Show. Thank you, John. Okay, that's another episode done. We'll see you next time.